like what you see here? Then be sure to subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7, an all new channel focusing on the history of Major League Baseball. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to subscribe now. And now, on with our feature presentation. Sports Illustrated has been around since 1955, and for more than six and a half decades, every week, has been there documenting the most notable stories in all of sports. Yes, it is a shell of its former self, which is sad to see. But I know for years and years, when it's still printed every single week, tons of people, including myself, eagerly awaited when it came in the mail, or when they saw it on the shelves in the grocery store at the checkout line, and read all the articles, going cover to cover to read the columns and the features and whatnot. That's what SI did best. They documented history. Each cover was a piece of history. Each article was a time capsule as to what the zeitgeist was. Every word was meticulously crafted to tell a story and a perspective that you couldn't get anywhere else. For many years, if you wanted the best articles and features and columns in sports, Sports Illustrated was the place to go. But as much as I said that Sports Illustrated documented history, it also created history in ways that you might not know about. The job of any publication is to tell the story, not to be the story. However, in 1999, one edition of Sports Illustrated turned out to change college football forever in ways that you might not realize. Because one edition of the publication turned out to be the deciding factor in a player choosing whether or not to come back for his senior season and return to his school for one last ride. And if you don't believe me, ask TCU. Because they'll tell you firsthand just how critical this publication was for the success of their football team that year. Because this is the story behind TCU, and one of the craziest moments in the history of Sports Illustrated. Before I talk about the actual article in question, we need some context to understand the player involved, and just how important he was for TCU. Royce Huffman was a jack-of-all-trades on special teams for the Horn Frogs, and was a weird hybrid of a player in the sense that not only did he return punts for the team, but he was their punter too, and was awfully good at both of these things. In 1996, for instance, he averaged 42.6 yards per punt, becoming the first TCU player since Chris Becker all the way back in 1988 to average at least 40 yards per punt. From 1996 to 98, in all three seasons, he averaged at least 40.8 yards per punt. Only three players in TCU history at the time had at least three seasons with that average, with those being Cameron Young from 1977 to 79 and James Gargas from 1981 to 83. During that 1997 season, his 3,368 punting yards on a 41.6 yards per punt average was the third highest in school history, and he had the third highest career yards per punt average to go along with that. Perhaps most notably during that 1997 season was his 74-yard punt against North Carolina, which was the longest punt by any TCU player since 1986. For his efforts in 1997, he was named a second-team All-Wax selection. So Huffman had a cannon of a leg, and that goes without saying. However, he also returned a fair number of punts for the Horn Frogs as well. Of the 26 punt returns that TCU had during the 1998 season, Huffman had 21 of them. He returned all 31 punts that TCU had in 1997, meaning that from 1997 to 98, Huffman returned over 91% of the punts that TCU forced. He was a special teams ace on both sides of the ball, and played an instrumental part in helping TCU improve the 7-5 in 1998, winning the Sun Bowl and marking their first bowl win since they won the Cotton Bowl all the way back in 1956. More on that game in just a bit, because it all ties together. And everything looks set for Huffman to come back to the Horn Frogs in 1999. He'd be punting and returning for the fourth straight season, and would cap his TCU career off as one of the greatest special teams players in program history, the likes of which we would never see again. However, 
Huffman truly was an exceptional athlete. And as great as he was at football, and trust me, he was great, he was even better at another sport, with that sport being baseball. You can't talk about the history of TCU baseball without talking about Huffman, because if there's a record, odds are, Huffman holds it. He leads TCU all-time with 317 hits, 44 home runs, 59 doubles, 158 walks, and 528 stolen bases. In 1996, as a freshman, he hit 360, was named to the All-Southwest Conference team, and was named the Southwest Conference Freshman of the Year. He's in the TCU Hall of Fame for a reason. The man was a true dual score threat, and was such a good baseball player that in 1999, the Houston Astros drafted him in the 12th round of the MLB Draft. Seemed like a dream scenario, seeing as he was born in Houston and lived his whole life in Texas. Upon getting drafted by the Astros, he played rookie ball in the Appalachian League for the Martinsville Astros, and was doing incredibly well there, picking up right where he left off from his college days. He hit 296 with an on-base percentage nearing 400, and was a menace on the base paths, stealing 18 bases while only being caught twice. Again, it's pretty unsurprising that he was super fast, seeing as he kind of have to be in order to return punts. Everything was going great for Huffman. He was officially a baseball player in the Astros farm system, and looked like he was going to work his way up the ranks. Sure, this meant that he had to give football behind, and wouldn't be able to play for TCU during his senior season, but it felt absolutely worth it. But then, something would happen that would change Huffman's mind forever. On July 26, 1999, Sports Illustrated would release a special double issue commemorating the end of the 20th century, and showing the best photos in the history of sports. Many people consider this to be one of the greatest and most iconic issues of all time for the magazine. Of course, you had your usual suspects with the photos, like Brandy Chastain after winning the 1999 Women's World Cup, Michael Jordan Duncan, and the iconic fight between Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston. And Huffman was an avid reader of Sports Illustrated, so naturally, he was reading this issue when I came out. However, buried among all the photos and articles behind the photos was an article about the 1957 Cotton Bowl, written by Gary Smith, where Marvin Newman photographed the locker room before the Horn Frogs were about to take the field for that game. As Smith writes on this photo, you won't disturb a single soul in this locker room. They're all lost in that place most folks go maybe once or twice in a lifetime, when their mamas or daddies die or their children are born. A place they don't go nearly as often as they should. Trust me, these boys will never know you're here. In other words, everyone is so focused on themselves and getting in the right mindset that nothing else around them matters. It's a powerful photo. It's one you probably have never seen before. But it's one that Gary Smith chose to include in this edition, despite its lack of prominence, for that exact reason. Because this photo, maybe more than any other, symbolizes what sports are about. As Smith wrote, not claiming it's better than the famous one of Muhammad Ali standing and snarling over Sonny Liston laid out like a cockroach the morning after the Bugman comes. Or that picture of Willie Mays catching the ball over his shoulders in the 1954 World Series or any number of others. But you can walk around inside this picture in a way you can't in those others, peer right inside the tunnel these boys have entered. Almost reminds you of a painting by Norman Rockwell. And in the article written by Smith about that photo was a quote from TCU's head coach for that game, E. Martin. Martin addressed the team before they went out on the field for that cotton bowl. And Martin said, I wanna thank you fellas, Seniors in this room, no need to tell you how I feel about you. You were my first recruiting class, came in green just like me, and accomplished some great things. Now, you're about to split up, go your separate ways, and this will be the game you remember the rest of your days. Life's about to change, lads. You're never going to capture this moment again. And it was as though that quote by Martin spoke directly to Huffman. It was as if that quote even though it was about the Cotton Bowl more than four decades before, 
never became more applicable than it was right now. Because at that moment, after reading that quote, Huffman knew what he had to do. He had to come back. He would get plenty of chances to play baseball, but he would only have one chance to be a senior and play football. And with that, despite the fact that Martinsville was 37-22, and 22, was in first place, and Huffman was playing lights out, Huffman decided to leave the team and go back to college to play one more season of college football. As Huffman said, it stressed me out for the longest time. I kept waiting for something or somebody to tell me what to do. But the smell of the grass, the roar of the crowds, the things that make college football what it is, are something that I couldn't have ever gotten back again. I'm lucky enough to have one more season to be with those guys, and I wasn't going to miss it. I think we're going to do something special this season. I want to be a part of it. And man was Huffman right on that one. Because TCU definitely did something special, and then some. They ended the season going 8-4, which was tied for the most wins they've had in a season since 1984. And they won the WAC for the first time in program history, and marking just their second conference title since the start of the 1960s. They even ended the season by defeating a number 19 ranked East Carolina team in the Alabama Bowl shocking a ton of people with that 28-14 victory to cap off one of their best seasons ever at the time. And Huffman saved his best for last, as not only did he average 40 yards per putt, but he was an absolutely dominant return man, finishing first in the conference by averaging 11.1 yards per punt return. No, he didn't return all the punts, as he conceded to the team that he couldn't do that and put his baseball career in jeopardy. But when he did have the ball in his hands, man, he was electric. And for what it's worth, after the season, Huffman returned to baseball and played in the minors all the way until 2009, making it up to AAA and actually spending the final seven years of his career bouncing around various AAA teams without ever getting the call up to the majors. Which is a bit odd, seeing as he was a 286 hitter in AAA and his numbers were quite good with one season hitting 309, but that's neither here nor there. Bottom line is that it worked out for Huffman in the end. He got to play one final season of football, and he got to continue his baseball career as though none of this ever happened. But it's crazy how none of this would have been possible without one article in Sports Illustrated. Had Gary Smith not written that article, and had not included that photograph from the 50s that very few people knew about, College football history is completely different. Huffman probably never comes back for his senior season. TCU might not win the WAC, since they would lose a key part of their special teams. A lot changes. There's an old saying that says that a picture is worth a thousand words. And never in college football has that been truer than with Royce Huffman. Because in this case, one picture changed history forever. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.